So we're going to talk about birds today, um, and we're going to talk about birds that eat insects a lot. But before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit about conservation, and then we'll try and understand how insect eating birds could help us conserve birds and nature more generally. So let's start off with kind of a global view on conservation. So right now, about 11% of Earth's land surface is protected in some way, be it a national park or a wildlife preserve, something like that. And it's a pretty good number. It's a number that's been increasing over the last few decades, though that rate of increase has slowed recently. And it reflects our knowledge that as scientists, one of the best ways to preserve species on Earth is to kind of safeguard their habitat, stop all that deforestation from happening in certain areas, protect them from hunting, things like that. And so we've done a pretty good job at conserving a lot of species on Earth through these protected areas. But that 11% number pales in comparison to the amount of Earth's land surface that's currently covered in agriculture. So that's crops or pastures. And it's around 40% of Earth's land surface. And for a really long time, as scientists, we've kind of thought of this agriculture as like a biological desert where nothing would live. And I think that that's likely because we've thought of agriculture kind of like this picture here. So this is a uh, soybean plantation in Brazil. And you can see this used to be all tropical rainforest. Now it's soybean. And we've got this one crop that's just stretching off as far as the eye can see. And there's probably not that, many wild, that much wildlife living in that area right now. But you know, not all agriculture really looks like that picture. So here's a picture from one of the places I work in southern Costa Rica. And I'm going to point out some differences between this photo and the last photo that make it really, really different, and therefore, I think, a lot more potential for conserving nature. So the first thing to note about this photo is there's actually a lot of tropical forest here. You can see a small forest patch in the foreground running along this river with some forest around that, and then some larger patches in the back. So in this area in southern Costa Rica, where I took this photo, there's only one protected area, one reserve, and it's kind of like a glorified forest patch. It's about 230 hectares in size, so really, really, really small. But if you were kind of zooming above it and you were to just kind of click around all of the trees and pat forest patches and try and figure out what percent of this area of this, um, this study region still exists as native tropical rainforest, you'd find that there's about 35% of the area is still covered in rainforest. It's just in these really small little patches maintained on private lands by private landowners. So we might suspect that there would be some good scope for wildlife like birds and birds that eat insects to live in these forest patches. So the other thing that we should note is you see these little lines demarcating the different agricultural plots there. Those are hedgerows or fence rows, live fences. So instead of building an artificial you know, wire fence, these farmers are using trees to demarcate their different plot boundaries. And we know from work both up here around in Canada and in the United States, and also down in the tropics, that these little patches, these little, you know, little lines of live fences are really, really good at conserving nature and biodiversity, including birds as well. And then the last thing you'll notice is that it's not just one crop like that soybean. We've got a lot of things going on here. We got some bananas in the foreground and a little patch in the back. We've got some coffee that's interspersed in with the bananas and then a bigger patch in the back. We've got a small pasture over there on the left. So together, this is what I would call a much more diversified landscape, a much more diversified agricultural system. And I think it's in this kind of landscape that we might expect to see a lot of wildlife still. And that wildlife, that, those aspects of nature, might actually be doing us some benefits especially if we're farmers. So we know as farmers that we face a lot of problems. One of these problems is that insect pests destroy a lot of our crops. So between 8 to 15% of all of our major food is destroyed by insects before it could reach your tables. And that's a big cost for those farmers. But we also know that there's a lot of natural pest control going on. And that means there's a lot of natural predators that go out and make their livings by eating all of those little pests. And that ends up saving farmers you know, billions of dollars annually. And we've recognized that for a really long time, tracing back to ancient times in China, when orchard farmers would actually cultivate ant nests and place them throughout their 
orchards in order to control pest infestations. That's a practice that still continues today and actually was recently exported to Africa and there are some African farmers doing that as well. So it could be that if we were to have this sort of diversified landscape with those little patches of forest and multiple crop types, that we might get more of those predators and then those predators might eat those pests and then the farmers might benefit and then nature might benefit because there would be more biodiversity around. So what we're gonna do today is first we're gonna ask ourselves, you know, how much biodiversity, how many different kinds of species would we be able to conserve on tropical farms? Is there a lot of scope for this? The second thing we're gonna ask ourselves is whether conserving that nature, conserving those birds would benefit us, particularly these farmers that are trying to cultivate coffee. We'll ask if they, conser if they consume coffee's most damaging insect pest to this uh, beetle down there in the bottom right. And then we'll ask what those farmers could do to manage their plantations, both for themselves to increase this pest control benefit and for nature to increase biodiversity all at the same time. So let's start off by looking at what scope there is for conserving these birds in these tropical agricultural landscapes. So to get at this question, I used this really remarkable data set, which was basically collected by this one ornithologist, this one bird expert, Jim Zook. Here you can see him on the right. And he has, ever since 1999, gone out and counted birds. He would basically walk a straight line for about 200 meters and count all of the birds he would see or hear near that straight line. So here he is conducting his census along a road in Costa Rica. And he would walk these lines, these transects as we call them, in three different types of areas. We would walk them in forest reserves that were strictly protected, in diversified farms, and in intensive monocultures. So the difference between these diversified farms and these monocultures are the exact differences from those photos before, where the diverse farms have lots of patches of forest nearby and hedgerows and multiple crops. And then the intensive monocultures have just one crop type. So he would go out and he would walk them and he would survey all the birds. And there were all of these transects that are located kind of all over Costa Rica, from the tropical dry forests of the north Guanacaste all the way down to the tropical wet forest in the south, Las Cruces. There are 44 of them all across Costa Rica, and he walks them six times per year ever since 1999. And so in doing this, he's counted over 125,000 birds across about 500 species, which makes this one of the biggest data sets available for any kind of tropical group of organisms. So with this amazing data set, we can begin to ask ourselves questions. Like, you know, how good are diversified farms at conserving birds? Are they as good as forest reserves? Are they almost as bad as intensive monocultures? And so the first thing we could ask is, okay, how many species does Jim see on average when he walks a line, when he walks that transect? And so here you can see the years that he would do these surveys from 2001 to 2012 on the right. The surveys are ongoing, but we didn't have the data yet for the most recent years. And on the y-axis here of this graph, you can see just the number of species he would see. So what's really remarkable here is that these top two lines are basically the same, which means that he sees almost as many birds in the forest reserve, in the diversified farms as in the forest reserves. But when you go into these monocultures, these expansive crop areas, you see almost half as many birds. So diversified farms conserve a remarkable amount of species, almost on a farm, on a par with forests. But we know that agriculture is, an, is expanding at these really, really rapid rates, right? So we can't just think about how many birds there are on one given farm. Here's some photos of some of these sites that he'll survey in Costa Rica. Here's a pineapple plantation and a pasture. And we know that there are land grabs going on in Africa by the hundreds of thousands of hectares and similar conversions to soybean and to pasture in the Amazon and Brazil. So when we think about agriculture at those really gigantic scales, we also need to think about biodiversity at those really large scales. And to do that, I'm gonna do a little bit of an illustration here. So imagine we've got two different kinds of forests. We've got a wet forest and we've got a dry forest. We would expect that there would be different species that live in those different places. They're different habitats and they're really far apart. So we get different birds, they're different colors here. Now, if we were to convert these forests to agriculture, here we've got pineapple and sugarcane, 
we would expect that some of these species wouldn't be able to deal with that change and they would go locally extinct. And there would be other birds, though, that could maybe persist. And, you know, to a bird, the difference between the sugar cane and the pineapple is probably not that great. It's just, you know, one stretching field. And if it could do well in sugar cane, maybe it does really well in pineapple. So if we had that situation going on, what we could see is some birds spreading over large regions, other birds kind of going locally extinct. And in that case, while we still have the same number of species on each farm as we did before, we've still lost species when you look at the whole system because these distant sites have become a lot more similar in the species that occupy them. So what we can do is we can look in this data set and we can ask, okay, how similar are those locations that Jim surveyed in the wet areas and in the dry areas? And when we look in forests, are these communities very different? Do they have different birds? And if we look in agriculture, do they have different birds still? So here we have a measure of how different these uh, groups of birds are. Don't worry about what that measure is. And what you can see here is that once again, the diversified farms conserve these different bird groups just as well as forest does. But in the intensive monocultures, we see that a lot of the same species are spreading over big regions and occupying them. And so we're seeing homogenization of biodiversity. We're seeing that if you look at this really large scale, it's kind of the same species everywhere on these monoculture farms. So this tells us that there is some good scope potentially for conserving biodiversity at these very large scales. Okay, so we know that diversified farms do well on the farm, and we know at larger scales they do well as well. Now we wanted to know whether, like, what kinds of birds were occupying these farms. Are they, you know, just certain groups like, you know, pigeons and doves and sparrows and things like that? Or are we able to conserve birds all across the tree of life? So when you guys were walking outside, you saw how all of these different organisms were all related to each other and formed this kind of tree of life. Well, are these farms getting all of the different kinds of birds across that tree, all those different groups, you know, from a hawk to a sparrow to a robin? Or are they only getting certain kinds and certain families, like a bunch of different species of sparrows? And to answer that question, we can build a relationship that says how closely related all these different birds are. So here we've got, you know, a wren and a um, sparrow, and we see that they're more closely related to each other than they are to that tinamou or to that hummingbird. Now, how would we lose this diversity across the tree of life? Well, there's a couple ways. First is really simple. We could just lose a species. So if we lost that tinamou, then we have less biodiversity. And then the second way is a little bit more complicated, but it might be that if we had that group of birds, those three, and we were to replace that wren with another kind of sparrow, then what we've done is we've created this group of birds that are much more closely related, and we've lost this lineage. And in doing so, we've lost some of the diversity of the tree of life that we could actually measure in all of the billions of years of evolutionary history that went into making that group of birds. So if we did that, and measured all that evolutionary history at these different kinds of land uses, we see that, again, forests are doing really well at conserving evolutionary history, literally measured in billions of years that it took to make these birds. And the diversified farms do a little bit worse, but still better than these intensive monocultures. So this is telling us that forests and, to a lesser extent, diversified agriculture are able to conserve biodiversity across the tree of life. So I've kind of given you three different examples now of how I think these tropical farms actually do have a lot of scope for conserving all of these different species of birds. So now let's ask ourselves, if we were to create these diversified farms, what benefits would the farmers potentially get? Could they control these insect pests? And to do that, we're going to focus in on coffee. So why would I focus on coffee? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, coffee is a $90 billion retail value industry, so it's really economically important. And then maybe even more importantly, about 20 million families or 100 million people make their livelihoods by growing coffee. And so it's really important from a human well-being perspective. And then we also know that it's really just extensive. It's grown in more than 50 countries across more than 10 million hectares. It's a very dominant land use. And because of that, it has a big impact on nature. 
And finally, you guys might have heard about shade-grown coffee before. So this is the idea that coffee could maybe be grown under this canopy of native trees, and that would be really good for nature. But you might, might have also been heard, uh, hearing how that was shade-grown plantations are being chopped down and replaced with these kind of extensive sun plantations, which are just coffee grown under the sun. And that has a lot of impacts on biodiversity, potentially on birds. So we've got this great system here where we've got this crop that's really, really important to us economically and for human well-beings. And at the same time, we know that this intensification, this loss of trees and patches of forest near coffee is causing reductions in species and wildlife. And so maybe that has an impact on the coffee growers themselves. So we wanted to look at coffee's primary pest, the thing that eats the coffee berries and competes with us for what we want, the coffee berry borer beetle. So here he is. He's way, way, way bigger in that photo than you would actually see him in real life. It's only two millimeters in size. And despite its small size, it has a really big impact. It burrows its way inside of the coffee beans and eats them from the inside out. And because of that, it's the only one of more than 850 different kinds of insects that are found in coffee plantations that actually compete with us for the thing that we want, which are those beans. It comes from Africa, where coffee is from. And now it's in almost every coffee-producing country except for those ones, China, Nepal, and Papua New Guinea. And it got to Costa Rica, where I was studying this pest, really, relatively recently, to two, in the year 2000 in Costa Rica and in our study sites in the year 2005. So we wanted to know whether birds were consuming this pest just a few years after it arrived. And to know that, we need to know something about how this pest lives, its life cycle. So I'll take you through it. So in March and April, the berry borer starts flying around and it gets caught a lot in traps. So you see this big bulge in red in the April and May months for when the berry borer is starting to get caught in these traps as it's flying around and looking for a new berry. It finds the coffee berry and then it starts burrowing its way inside. Once it's inside, it lays its eggs and the eggs develop into larvae and then into pupae and then finally into adults. And then the brothers mate with the sisters inside of the berries the brothers then die, never having seen the light of day. And the sisters then make their way off into some other berries that are nearby throughout the year until harvest time comes when all of these berries are being harvested. How does the berry borer make it into the next year? Well, there are some berries that are left on the coffee bushes and some fall onto the ground. And those ones are the way that the berry borer can persist into the next year and then fly again to go infect some more berries. So one of the good ways to control this pest is to just try and keep as many berries off the ground and off the trees once you're done harvesting as possible. But some always escape through. And pesticides don't really work on these guys because they evolve really, really rapidly. So we wanted to know whether birds and actually bats as well could possibly be consuming this pest. So how could we figure this out? Well, to do that, we wanted to, we basically did this experiment where we would keep birds and bats off of the coffee plants and then see what happened to the infestations of this pest. So here you can see one of my field assistants standing on a ladder, building this big cage around these coffee plants that are about as tall as I am, maybe a little bit taller. And so basically, if you would keep the birds off, then you could monitor the changes in how many berry borers there were around. So we had four different treatments that we were looking at. So we had these cages that were always around the coffee plants that would exclude both birds and bats. Then we had these cages that would be lowered down during the day when birds were active and then raised up every night so that the bats could come in and eat all the pests they wanted. We had the reverse situation where the birds could come in and eat and the bats couldn't. And then we had these open frame kind of control situations where both birds and bats could get in. So here on the y-axis, we've got the percent of these berries that are infested, that are eaten by this pest, that are ruined. And you can see that before the experiment began, there were no differences between any of our plants, the ones that we were going to exclude the birds from, or the bats from, or both, or neither. They were all the same, which is good. Then for three months, we raised and lowered all these cages every day, every morning, every night. And at the end of it, we resurveyed all of these plants and looked at what the change in all this infestation was. 
And we found that excluding birds caused almost a doubling of infestation. So birds were having the infestations of this pest on coffee plants. And bats really didn't have much of an effect at all. So then we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just a one season type of crazy event. And so we did it again in the dry season. And again, we found that birds doubled infestation, or excluding birds um, caused a doubling of infestation of this pest. And there was a slight increase with excluding the bats, but it wasn't really important. It was very marginal. So basically, we concluded that birds, but not bats, were substantially reducing this pest in just a few years after it got to our study sites in Costa Rica. So we can begin to take a guess at how much money the farmers are actually getting by these birds providing this free service to them. So we can take the percent of the berries that birds are saving every year. We can multiply that by the amount of coffee that the farm is producing, what the farmer tells us. We can multiply that by the price of coffee that the farmer gets from selling to a cooperative locally. And we can divide by the area of the farm, and that'll tell us the benefit that the birds provide per area per year. So for a frame of reference, the average income in Costa Rica is about 6,500 US dollars per year. Birds, we found, were preventing between $75 to $350 per hectare in yield losses, depending on which farm and what season you were in. So for that one farm where we were kind of doing that big experiment, we found that in one year, in 2011 to 2012, that was worth about $10,000. So we're not saying that birds are doubling farmer income. There's a lot of costs inherent in, in making coffee. But it's a lot of money that birds are providing these coffee growers free of charge. So then we wanted to know whether birds were doing anything else. There are other pests on these plantations that you know, eat the coffee leaves or other parts of the plant, stunt its growth. And so at the same time that we were looking for that one pest, we started you know, looking for all the other insects. So here I am beating the coffee plants with this sweep net to try and collect all the insects I can, and then going down and looking at all the leaves and trying to figure out whether they were eaten by insects. And so if we group the insects into two different categories, we got like the spiders that are insects that eat other insects. And then we've got the leaf-eating insects, the ones that actually damage the coffee plants. We saw that the birds were really spending a lot of time eating these leaf-eating insects, and thereby were preventing this other type of damage to coffee, this damage to its leaves. Bats, on the other hand, really liked to eat these predatory insects, like spiders that are active at night. And they eat some leaf-eating insects as well, but not as many. So it was looking like birds were eating the herbivores and preventing damage, and bats were eating the predators and not really having any impact on coffee at all. So all in all, we basically found that you know, not only do we have a lot of scope for conserving these birds on these farms, but these birds are providing us with this free of charge benefit this really, really economically important control of insect pests. So the next question we wanted to ask ourselves was, OK, now we know that this is going on. What can the farmers do to benefit those birds and get them to eat more of these pests on their coffee farms? So in order to answer that question, we first had to ask ourselves a different question, which was, which are the birds that are important here? Which are the ones that are actually eating this pest? And to get at that question, we had the not so glamorous task of looking through a lot of bird poop. We had to look through the bird poop and try and figure out which were the species that were eating these pests. So what would we do? Well, we first wanted to catch birds to get their poop. So we would put out these nets, and the birds would fly into the net, and we would get the bird out of the net. And we would put them in a little bag and bring them back to a station. And when they were in the bag, they got really scared, and they would poop in the bag. And we could then collect that. That was great data. We could put it in vials. Here we've got you know, 1,500 different samples. And then once we had all of those different vials, we could look and try and figure out whether we could find the DNA of that one pest inside of those vials of bird poop. So we did that. We looked through all those 1,500 different samples from birds. And at the very end of it, we identified at least six different kinds of birds. There are probably others, but it's pretty hard to find pest DNA in bird poop. So we know at least there are six of them that are definitely consuming this pest. And here they are. So five of the six of them are birds that only live kind of south of um, the United States. 
where I can get this guy sometimes comes in the US. But then you guys might recognize this guy, the yellow warbler, which is going to be making his way back up here um, in just maybe a few weeks to a month and having fueled that big journey north by consuming all of these berry borers in Costa Rica. So now we know that there are these six different species that consume this pest. Undoubtedly, there are probably others, but we know that these guys definitely do. So then we could go out to some farms and survey these guys in particular and see what happens to them and what farmers might be able to do to help these birds out. And so here, every dot on this graph is a coffee farm that we went out and caught birds on. And on the x-axis here, we've got how much forest is there surrounding the farm. So these farms over here chopped down most of the forest surrounding their farm, whereas those ones on that end maintained a lot of those forest patches. And on the y-axis, we've got just the number of all of these berry borer eating birds, those six species that we would catch over six years. And so you guys can see a pretty strong relationship here, right? It looks to me like the farms that had more forest surrounding them had more of these pest eating birds. So that was pretty important to see. Maybe if the farmers conserved some patches of forest nearby, they could benefit these birds. But what happens to the pests themselves? So we went on to those six farms and a bunch of other ones, and we surveyed these pests. So here on the x-axis, again, we've got the amount of forest surrounding the farm. And on the y-axis now, we've got the percent of the berries that are eaten by this pest. And you can see this negative relationship here now. So the more forest around your farm, the less berry borers you have, which is good for the farmer. Now, there's a lot of scatter in this graph, but you kind of expect that given that some farmers are putting out pesticides, some aren't, some are high up and high elevations, some are lower. So to see this, despite all of that variation, is pretty encouraging. So it looks to us like the berry borer infestations are less severe on more forested farms. So now that we have some of these relationships and going back to that cage experiment where we would exclude the birds, we could look to see whether birds were eating more pests near forest, and it turned out they were. So when we have all of that information together, we can make some statements about how great that forest, those small patches of forest is in this study area. So from what our models would predict, we predict that you know these forest patches are providing habitat for an additional 50,000 birds of those six species that definitely eat those pests. They're also doubling the number of coffee berries that are being saved by birds. So these small forest patches are really important. And maybe the farmers want to conserve them. But if we think a little deeper, we might realize that you know birds are not just good for eating insects. They're good for a lot of things. They pollinate plants. They disperse seeds. Um, they drive ecotourism. A lot of people really, really will pay a lot of money to go around and watch birds. We also know that birds are really essential in that there are these, these unique organisms. That are, they have these unique roles across the tree of life. And if we were to lose them, then maybe we would lose some of these millions of years of evolutionary history that we talked about earlier. Some of them are just really beautiful as well. And some, like those vultures, are just declining at a really rapid rate. So we might want to conserve birds because we want to prevent these loss of species. So there's a lot of different objectives that a person might have when they think about which types of birds they would want to conserve. And the birds that would eat that pest might not be the same ones that a bird watcher likes or that pollinates a plant or that's just really pretty. So what we wanted to do was ask ourselves, all right, so how could we manage this system for all of these different types of object objectives that people might have? So we go back out and we think about three different types of places where birds could live. We've got the forest reserves, we've got small patches of forest, and then we've got the farms, the coffee plantations. And we went out and we surveyed birds. We caught them on all of these different areas. And then we asked, OK, how important are all of these different species that we caught for these different benefits that we might get from them, or these objectives that we hope to achieve, like preventing the loss of species or preserving those really unique species? And then we wanted to ask ourselves, you know, if we did some different scenarios, what would happen to those objectives? So if we were to convert a coffee plantation to a forest reserve, what would happen? And if we were just to simply give the farmers some money and ask them to preserve some patches of forest or, you know, some individual trees in and around their plantations, what would happen? So we first asked what would happen to the rare birds, the ones that are declining globally and that we might care about a lot. Kind of unsurprisingly, if we created a forest reserve, those guys would do well. 
So that would be good for them. We also know that the birds that live in Costa Rica and really kind of only a few other areas nearby and nowhere else in the world, those, they call them endemic birds, those would do well if we converted coffee to a forest reserve as well. And if we thought about those evolutionary unique birds, the ones that don't have that many relatives, those guys we learned earlier do well in forest. Okay, that makes sense. As for the birds that pollinate, you know, some birds would do, some species would do good, some species would do bad, and it kind of comes out in a wash. For the birds that disperse seeds, we actually found that birds were dispersing more seeds on, in the coffee farms by a little bit, but it was just a little bit. And for the pest-eating birds, we found the same sort of thing. And for the birds that were mentioned in newspapers, so we wanted to know how important these birds were to people, so we went out to all of the Costa Rican newspapers and tried to figure out, you know, how often are all these different species being mentioned. And we found that the birds that are meant that people have in their backyards are the ones that are most often discussed in their national media. So those birds, if we were to convert coffee to a forest reserve, would actually do pretty poorly. And then what about those birds that bird watchers really like? Well, those guys would do really well in the forest reserves. So we went to bird watching websites and tallied up all the ones that they advertise as being the ones you could go and see uh, and asked some bird watching guides as well. And found out that those birds that live in forests in those deep dark forests are the ones that birders really will pay a lot of money to come see. Okay, so by looking at these arrows, you can see that there are some trade-offs here, right? If we were to get rid of those coffee farms and replace it with a forest reserve, we would get some birds that would achieve some objectives for us, and then maybe we would lose some other ones like these birds that are mentioned in newspapers that might be kind of culturally important to us. So what would happen if instead we just paid those farmers to maintain small patches of forest around their farms or individual trees and things like that? What would happen? Well, you know, on a whole, we found that most of these birds would do better off. Almost no species, except for a few ones that are mentioned in newspapers, do better on these extensive sun plantations than if you were to add some individual trees and patches of forest nearby. So when conservationists, when environmentalists, always talk about creating these big reserves, that's great and really important for a lot, a lot of species. You're not going to get to conserve the world's gorillas, for example, if you were just to preserve small patches of forest around farms. But what we also fail to recognize sometimes is that there's a lot of opportunity to conserve nature in our backyards. And by having these small patches of forest, we could conserve a lot of the different birds that mean a lot to us. So why are tropical birds so cool? Well, I would say there's a couple of reasons that we kind of take away from our talk today. First, they can save us a lot of money by eating pests and by doing a lot of other things too. They pollinate plants, they disperse seeds, they drive ecotourism, they're really pretty, they're really important. So that's really cool. And then I think it's really amazing to know that just with a little effort, birds can really live alongside us. There are some species that can only live in these deep, dark forest reserves, that's true. But there are a lot of species that can really benefit from kind of small actions like preserving these small patches of forest or planting multiple crops or putting out those hedgerows in the farm. So with that, I would like to thank you guys and take any questions.